Okay, so I'm going to talk about a bit of science and a little bit of data to start with. Uh, new figures for greenhouse gases, the last year came out today, and the level of emissions uh, grew 0.6% in the last year, released by the Global Carbon Project today. So we're still making the problem worse at an increasing rate. So every year the amount of emissions from fossil fuels is greater than the previous year. We haven't even flattened that out yet. Interestingly, if you look at gas, oil and coal, coal emissions went down 0.9% in a year, oil went up 0.9% and gas went up 2.6%. And that's why we've got a problem because in total they're going up. The other interesting thing worthwhile contemplating, this is a complicated chart. Look at the, the, the blue arrow, this is over the last sort of 30 years. Um, the blue arrow is, is a chart of the amount of energy being produced and the amount of fossil fuel emissions associated with that energy. And given that those two lines are the same, there's a really profound and unhappy consequence. And that is that we are not decarbonising the energy system. So the red line is the amount of CO2 embodied in each unit of energy that we are using. And if you look at 30 years, the line has been flat. So we are not effectively decarbonising our energy system. And the consequence of this, of, of course, is that the, number, the amount of greenhouse gases in the air, the, the main chart, is going up um, at the end of the 19th century that was 280 parts per million, which is where it had been roughly for the last 10,000 years, and it's now above 410. So we've gone from 280 to 410 in about 120 years. Uh, and I'll put the methane one up there as well. So, as a consequence of that, unsurprisingly, because carbon dioxide and methane are like wrapping a blanket around the earth, the, the more blankets you put around the earth, the hotter it gets. And so the temperature is going up and it's probably actually going up at a greater rate at the moment. So yesterday some people at the conference in Madrid announced that the rate of warming compared to the end of the 19th century is now 1.1 degrees. So that's just a background of sort of some evidence. It's, it's not as spooky a chart as you look. This is just running a whole lot of climate models out for the next hundred years uh, with three lots of emissions where emissions don't peak where they keep on going up the middle dotted line which is sort of the Paris sort of commitments and maybe a bit more and the bottom line is doing a lot more and all these blue lines are just different models and different runs and then I looked at all these runs so some are high emissions some are emissions dropping really quickly I looked at all these runs and said when are we going to get to 1.5 and I've circled some dots there and you can see that we will be at 1.5 in about 10 years from now and it doesn't matter which emissions trajectory we we're on, we will get there the same because that's basically already locked into the system. But if you look at say the three degree dark red ones, you can see a huge difference between up here and down there. So cutting emissions make a really crucial difference in the, in the long run, but for the next 10 years it's not. So all the people who tell you that this blah 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 carbon budget left for 1.5 degrees are just ignoring this. It's locked into the system. Sorry about that, but that's the way it is. And there's plenty of peer-reviewed evidence to say that. So I'm going to talk mainly about tipping points and a, and a paper which came out last week which got um, headlines around the world. Uh, a relatively straight report even made it on the front page of The Australian, which was something of a, of a miracle. So I want to talk about that report because it really encapsulates a lot of the work that I've been engaged in for the last 10 years. And it comes to a question of a thing called climate sensitivity, which is literally how sensitive is the climate to more greenhouse gases. And the very simple proposition is climate sensitivity is a number of how much warming there will be if you double the amount of CO2 or equivalent in the atmosphere. So if we go from 280 to 560, a doubling, how much does the planet warm? Because this number then informs all the other things that flow from it, including how much carbon budget you've got left. Traditionally, um, we would say that we've gone from 280 to 410, 
and that that's about one and a half degrees because that's where we've been another 10 years. So you say, okay, we've roughly got halfway from 280 to 560, around about 400, 410, so it's one and a half degrees. But then if you look at climate history, the last time we had the current level of greenhouse gases around 400 parts per million, the planet was actually three degrees warmer, not a degree and a half, and sea levels were 25 metres high. So these two numbers sort of appear to be in contradiction. And that's because there's a difference between short-term and long-term consequences. Um, so I'm going to try and explain this because it really affects the rest of this presentation. So when we put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it acts as a blanket. It traps more heat. That heat adds energy to the atmosphere. So winds can become stronger. Cyclones can become stronger. For every degree that it warms, uh, the amount of water vapour in the air increases by about 7%. So that means you can get more devastating typhoons. It also means you can get stronger, more extreme uh, rain events, storm events, because you've got a bigger amount of water in the air. And so there are another number of other short-term consequences uh, that flow from that heat, the energy, and, and the water vapour. More clouds and that sort of thing. Now that's what is called short-term climate sensitivity. You increase these greenhouse gases, these things happen, and if you double the greenhouse gases, that will, double, that will increase warming by three degrees. Hence, halfway to 560, we've got one and a half degrees now. So that's sort of logical. But then there are other consequences of warming the atmosphere which take longer to occur, which are normally called long-term consequences. But because we are changing the atmosphere so quickly, those long-term things, which normally happen over thousands to millions of years, are now happening in a really short period of time because the rate at which we are putting CO2 in the atmosphere is unprecedented in history by a factor of 10 to 30. Um, and so those long-term consequences, those long-term feedbacks, are things like melting of the big ice sheets in the Arctic, the Antarctic, and even the Himalayas. And there's now some data which suggests that perhaps a quarter of the Himalayan ice mass has already gone. The other thing that happens is that the stores of carbon in the planet can be disturbed. I mean, for example, if you get fires and drought and the Amazon is, is burnt and comes back as a sclerophyll forest, a lot of carbon will be released in the atmosphere, a process that's happening now and a process that's probably happening in New South Wales and Queensland from now on because some old wet forests are probably not going to come back. The other thing, of course, is that there's large amounts of carbon dioxide, carbon stored uh, in the Arctic as permafrost, permanently frozen ground, with, with, which is very carbon dense. If and as, as is happening now, that starts to melt, that carbon comes up in the atmosphere. So as well as the CO2 you put up, you can, can trigger another round of carbon going to the atmosphere, and that will make the, warmer, the warming longer. And that is called long-term climate sensitivity, uh, and that number is probably five to six. And historically, people like James Hansen, who've looked for the history of climate, say over and over again for the last 20 years, short-term sensitivity three, long-term six. And this is a problem because the work of the IPCC and the models they run and the data they put out assume that this is not happening. This does not exist. And so you get a whole lot of delusional results. I mean, the IPCC said in one of its first reports that the Antarctic ice sheet would be stable and wouldn't melt for the next thousand years. And in 2014, we had uh, a paper by Rigno et al. saying that the West Antarctic ice sheet or certain glaciers in that are already destabilised and need no further energy uh, to continue that path. So this is part of the problem we have, that, that, that these long-term feedbacks have not been included and they have not been included uh, in the carbon budgets. So they say there's a carbon budget. We've got so much carbon more we can burn to two degrees. But that's assuming this. If you assume this, all that carbon budget just disappears because the warming for the amount of greenhouse gases we have in the air now is not one and a half. In the long term, it's three. 
So if the implied warming, if we stayed at 400 parts per million, is three degrees, there's hardly a carbon budget left for two, is there? So this is the problem that we have, that these numbers keep on getting tossed out that simply are fanciful, in my humble opinion. So if we look at what's gone on, um, for the last 10,000 years, the period of the Holocene of human settlement, of fixed settlement, of human civilization, if you want to use that somewhat culturally jaundiced term, um, we have been between naught and five degree and half degree warmer than the 19 than the 19th century. We are now up to 1.1. So we are now, in terms of the global temperature, way outside anything human civilization, fixed settlement societies have ever, ex have ever experienced. Already we have passed tipping points for the loss of the Arctic sea ice, for corals. The barrier reef is effectively in a death spiral. I mean, some warming two years ago and half of what was left disappeared again. So we're down to a quarter of what the barrier reef was 30 years ago. And another, another good El Nino or two and the rest of it will probably go. That's just the reality at one and a bit degrees. And then, of course, there are other um, system changes which are close at hand and I'll come back to what the scientists say at the moment. And once you get towards two degrees, some of those big long-term feedbacks like uh, pushing a, a, a sizable melting of the permafrost come into view. So if that's where we are, then the question is, if it's not safe at one degree, why in the hell do we have a fetish about one and a half degrees? I'll leave that question there. The Paris Agreement, the commitments that were made at Paris, which actually haven't been, the, the action since Paris are less than the commitments by a bit. So if the world did nothing more than the commitments that were made in Paris, we would get to three and a bit degrees. But if you take those long-term feedbacks we took into account, it's five degrees, which is why the World Meteorological Organisation a few weeks ago said that if we don't improve on Paris, we're on a range of three to five degrees of warming, and that is now accepted, I think, internationally. So let's have a look at what that means. Um, here is crop yields in a three degree warmer world. Red is bad, green is good. And if you take out the Tibetan plateau, uh, there's not much south of the US-Canadian border that's gonna look much good, is it? Because climate change in the end is about food and water, food security, water insecurity, the capacity of people to live and work and survive where they are and not get embroiled in regional conflicts and tear each other apart because of drought and desertification as we've seen in Syria, for example. And here's a figure of water stress by 2040. And red is extreme. Have a look at India, have a look at Central Asia, have a look at the Middle East, have a look at Northern China, have a look at the Maghreb, have a look at the southern Mediterranean. Have a look at Australia, have a look at the Andes side of the uh, South America and have a look at most of the United States. So all these impacts have consequences which we'll talk about. Uh, this year we did a couple of reports looking at, so we have these physical changes they obviously lead to social consequences in terms of where people can live and work. And, and those then have what I would call human security or national security consequences. And that is, if you can't live and work where you used to and survive and live, then there are going to be brawls. And we know with the one metre sea level rise, 20% of Bangladesh will be inundated and 30 million people will be displaced and India has built a 5,000 kilometre double strand barbed wire fence on the, along the whole of the Indian Bangladesh border. So that's the sort of story that we're talking about and we did in these papers. They're available on the Breakthrough website uh, if you want to read them. So if we get to four degrees, I think scientists are pretty agreed that four degrees is incompatible with the maintenance of human civilization and probably not stable because of the feedbacks. Uh, even the World Bank in sort of World Bank language said, there's no certainty that adaptation to four degrees is possible, which is sort of a, a nice way of saying something else. 
But even at three degrees for catastrophic outcomes, um, a report was done in 2007 called The Age of Consequences by some senior national security analysts in the US, and they looked at three degrees. In fact, we reproduced their scenario in one of those pink reports earlier this year, and they said, if the world got to three degrees, then international relations would be characterised by the word outright chaos, unquote. And you've seen that in Syria. You've seen it in, uh, across the Sahel. You've seen it in Mali. Um, you've seen it in the Arab Spring. I mean, the Arab Spring was triggered by, by epic uh, fires and droughts in Russia and China that wrecked the, the global uh, wheat market, spot wheat market. And nine of the ten most per capita most dependent countries in the world for wheat imports are in the Middle East. And the spot price of wheat in the world tripled, and that created the Arab Spring. So these are the chain of events between drought, fire, desertification, uh, food prices, water insecurity, conflict, political upheaval. Um, so this paper came out Thursday of last week and is a very big thing. Well, climate tipping points too risky to bet against by really the, the best climate scientist in Europe. And I want to take you through what it says because it sort of answers the somewhat challenging questions that are on the flyer <laughs> for today. The paper starts off by saying, we're looking at the evidence of the threat of exceeding the tipping points that I talked about, the permafrost and, and the Amazon and so on, and whether we have any control over them, which helps to find that we are in a climate emergency. So here are the leading climate scientists in Europe, including a guy called John Schellenhuber, who's the advisor to Angela Merkel, to the EU and to Pope Francis, saying this is a climate emergency. The first time scientists have said this in, in a collective, uh, unambiguous, peer-reviewed journal. And then they say that these individual tipping points are also connected so that the consequence of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So here's from their diagram. Here are nine tipping points. Uh, they identified 15 altogether 10 years ago. Here are nine of them, uh, this is in the paper, uh, that they think are, are active or close to, are either trouble or close to trouble because this is an imprecise science. I mean, in tipping points, there is non-linear change. I mean, an ice block tends to be either an ice block or water. It's not sort of half and half. And so ice sheets tend to be ice sheets, so they tend to be water, and they can change quite quickly. And they're difficult to predict, and they're difficult to model, which is why the IPCC has led them out. And so they have identified nine tipping points which are uh, active, um, you know, from the permafrost, the boreal forests, um, the slowing down of, of the Gulf Stream, uh, Australia's uh, coral reefs, the Greenland ice sheet, the, the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, and so on. And it said the interaction of these is greater than the sum of the parts. And then they drew some conclusions, which I'll go to because I think this is important. Several cryosphere, the cryosphere is the frozen world. Several cryosphere tipping points are dangerously close. West Antarctica might have passed the tipping point. Parts of East Antarctica might be similarly unstable. Models suggest that the Greenland ice sheet could be doomed at 1.5 degrees of warming, which could have happened as soon as 2030. So it's not will or will not. This is language of could, maybe, will, probably, not quite sure, because that's the way you have to write this thing. Because you don't, you cannot, in the end, finally write a history of tipping points until you well past them. You don't see the car accident happening. You tell the car accident story afterwards. Other tipping points could be triggered as low, at low levels of warming. A cluster of abrupt shifts uh, are possible between 1.5 and 2 degrees, including the slowing down of the Gulf Stream. Permafrost across the Arctic is beginning to irrevocably thaw and release carbon dioxide and methane. The boreal forest, the subarctic forest, is increasingly vulnerable. So they're saying all these tipping points are sort of in play. And then they have... Sheldon Hooper's done a little thing called a climate emergency uh, equation, which I'm not going to bother you a bit, but there's two, two bits. Uh, look, it's really simple. It says, if we're in emer emergency, is a function of, this is insurance, the risk, and risk is the likelihood multiplied by the damages. Is it likely to happen? And if it happened, how bad would it be? And Sheldon Hooper said that the damages, in fact, could be infinite. 
in climate change. So if you're a mathematician of, of even a low grade, you'll understand if part of an equation has, has an infinite number in it, then the answer is going to be infinite as well, no matter what else you do. Um, uh, multiply by the urgency, U, the urgency. And in a very clever way, he says, there are two things in urgency, and this is the tonic. There's the reaction time, the time it takes to avoid the problem. How long does it take the Titanic to steer away from the iceberg? That's called the reaction time. And then there's the intervention time, which is the time you've got left to act. And in this profound case, um, the intervention time was much shorter than the reaction time and the ship went down. And so that's an interesting question about the planetary system as well, about the relationship between these two sorts of time. And they say in their paper, if damaging cascades, these tipping points running together, can occur in a global tipping point, cannot be ruled out, which they can't, then this is an existential threat to human civilization, something we published extensively about three years ago. The evidence from tipping points alone suggests we're in a state of planetary emergency, which is interesting coming from scientists because there are some NGOs in Melbourne in Australia who still refuse to use the word. In fact, if you look at the, at the COP in Madrid at the moment, the, the, the branding for the COP is, this is not climate change, this is a climate emergency. They're not going to do any good there, but it's, it's pretty interesting how much the Europeans have changed the language uh, around thinking about this issue. And then they say, the intervention time, how much time we've got left to act to prevent tipping points, could, could have already shrunk towards zero, whereas reaction time to achieve net zero emissions is 30 years. They think it's hard to get to zero within 30. I mean, that's an interesting proposition because the more you, could, you consider it an emergency, the more of the world's global resources you, you put into decarbonising, the quicker you can do it. So if you can turn 30 years into 20 years or 15 or 10, then you're in a much better case because you've turned the ship around quicker than you thought you could. So that's there. Um, hence, we might already have lost control of where the tipping points happen. Might have. So that's what the latest science is saying. Not great, but that's a pretty honest exposition of, of, of what it is. Um, the other point they, they make is that if you zip past the tipping point really quickly and keep on heating really fast, the consequences are much faster and more profound than passing a tipping point really slowly. A bit like, you know, sort of going into a ditch as opposed to going over the cliff. There's a, you're off the road, but there's different consequences for doing it. Um, how fast is zero? This was in the presentation I gave a few months ago to, to, to XR. The evidence-based answer, people say, oh, five years, ten years, you know, how fast? And the answer is yesterday or the day before. We're already in danger. It's already too hot. We've already triggered things that we shouldn't have triggered. The practical answer is as fast as we possibly can. Long-term targets produce complacency. Policymakers talking about 2050, we'll do it in 2060. They'll do it at the end of time because they're not responsible for not achieving those goals. So... I'm not going to go into this, we did this last time. There are four things we can do. Carbon dioxide, which is long-lived in the atmosphere. The short-lived pollutants like methane, which are really important to cut because they have a short lifetime in the atmosphere, 10 years. So if you can cut the amount of methane that you're putting up, you feel a good effect within 10 years, whereas in carbon dioxide, it's, it's 100 years to 1,000 years. Uh, the third is to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. I mean, the first thing is to stop chopping down forests and wrecking forests and, and wetlands. So reforestation and, and restorative agriculture in all its forms. And the fourth thing, if it gets really bad, is to try and cool the planet by putting sulphates in the atmosphere, which have uh, a cooling effect. We have the economic capacity to do this. We have the, we have the um, technological capacity. That's not the question. It's a question of political will, which we'll talk about in the second half. Some words from Shellen Hoover, one of the authors of that paper. This was in a forward he did to a report we put out two years ago called What Lies Beneath. Climate change is now reaching the end game where... Emergency. Um, where very soon humanity must choose between taking unprecedented action or accepting that it has been too, left too late and bear the consequences. If we continue down the present path, there is a very big risk that we will just end our civilization. The human species will survive somehow but we will destroy almost everything we have built up over the last 2,000 years. So the world's climate scientists 
are now saying in a brutal and frank way what hasn't been said at this level of frankness for a long time. And I think that's good because you can't solve a problem until you actually understand the problem at its full depth. And I think we've got the stage now, particularly this year uh, in the climate emergency movement, of actually uh, having this conversation out. And I just finish with a couple of signs of that. The words existential and climate emergency were chosen as words of the year by dictionary.com and the Oxford Dictionary, uh, respectively. So the Oxford Dictionary said that, said that the, the, the word um, uh, climate emergency use had multiplied a hundred times this year compared to previous use. We have the, the global climate emergency declaration uh, movement, which in August of last year had 19 councils. August last year had 19 councils. As of yesterday, it had 1,212 councils in 23, council, in 23 countries. So this is uh, an incredible movement, trying to call it out like it is. And here's the sign from the, the Madrid conference. There's a whole lot of these things saying the Sahara is, is increasing, uh, Spain is desertifying, uh, this is not change, this is not a change, and then the key line, don't call it change, as in climate change, don't call it change, call it climate emergency. So that's the changing language that we're getting. Um, and I'll leave it there and we might talk about some politics after a little Q&A.